Good morning, and welcome this morning. Let us bow our heads, opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for another day of life, Lord, for bringing us here on this corner, Lord. For those who are able to watch from far away, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for what the time you have given us, Lord, for being so faithful to us, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to bless the word as it goes out this morning. We ask you this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. The first song will be, Because He Lives. Because He Lives, we have the hope. And we will not be anxious. Because we trust in our God. Amen. 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 God sent His Son, they called Him Jesus, He came to love, heal and forgive, He lived and died, to buy my pardon, and empty grave is there.
ability we have to bring forth God's Word, even in the midst of quarantine. Uh, we cannot be together right now, but we're together in spirit by way of Facebook Live. So praise the Lord for technology and the Lord allowing us to use the technology that He has provided. Well, this morning we are in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a book written to the Church of Jesus Christ that was going through great persecution. And ultimately, it's a book of comfort. We don't often think of Revelation as a book of comfort, but it is a comforting book because even in the midst of trials, tribulations, persecutions, and difficulties, we're reminded over and over again that Jesus Christ is still in charge. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is in charge. And that brings us comfort even as we go through the, the, uh, the coronavirus. He's in charge ultimately. And we are reminded this morning from Revelation chapter 1, beginning with verse 10, we're going to look this morning at Christ and His church. Emphasis being on His church. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We need to be reminded that the church ultimately belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the first one we'd like to examine here is some expectations Christ has for His church. First of all, He expects you to be at church on the Lord's day. Look at verse 10 of chapter 1. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Think about this. Where is John at this particular point? Well, verse 9 tells us where he was. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos. He was on an island. And it wasn't like the Hawaiian Islands. It was a penal colony on a barren rock about 30 miles off the coast of modern-day Turkey. It is where Rome put their prisoners. He was on a prison island, kind of like Alcatraz. For those of you that are familiar with the island of Alcatraz, he was on an island prison. And yet, on the Lord's day, he was in the spirit. He was receptive to the spiritual things of God, and God took him and gave him this great vision that he wrote down the book of Revelation. His spirit was receptive to the Spirit of God on the Lord's day. The Lord's day. The Lord's day is the first day of the week, Sunday. It was the day that the church began to set aside as a special commemoration of the resurrection. For the Lord Jesus rose on the first day of the week, Sunday. And the Lord expects His church to be together on the Lord's day. Now, obviously, we cannot be together during this period of time that hopefully ends soon, 
But once this period of quarantine is over, let me encourage you to get back in the habit of being at church on the Lord's Day. Some people might say, you know, I kind of like church on live stream and YouTube. Because I could do it laying in my bed. Some of you may be lying out right now. Praise God, at least you're listening in. But once the quarantine is lifted, and once we get the green light to come back together again, make sure you are here on the Lord's Day. We have to always heed the admonition of Hebrews chapter 10. And we have to always remind ourselves of this because God's people are and can become very inconsistent in church attendance on the Lord's Day. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. Some have a bad habit of forsaking the assembling together, but encouraging one another. And you, you can only do that if you're here. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So don't get comfortable. This is only a temporary thing we're going through. He expects us to be together on the Lord's Day just as John, the beloved apostle, modeled for us while in prison on an island called Patmos, he was, he set aside the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. It's interesting how the Lord has taken away all those things that occupied occupies people. People miss church because of sporting events. He took those away. People miss church because they're out shopping or at the swap meet. He took those away. People miss church because they're out at brunch or breakfast at restaurants. He took those away. He stripped away everything and given us a lot of free time to think. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, here's the second point. Christ knows the churches by name. Verse 11 of Revelation 1, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. And then he lists their names to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. All of these towns and cities, all in the same geographical area of modern day Turkey. So I don't know where Turkey is. I can't help you. I don't have a map. All these towns in the same geographical area had names and had churches. And what's impressive to me, he knows your name. He knows the name of the churches. He knows all about the individual churches. For instance, chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, and then look at verse 4, he knows this about them, I have this against you, you've left your first love. How does he know that detail? Because the church belongs to him. Look at verse 8, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this. Look at verse 10. He knows this. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. You will be tested and have tribulation ten days. 
Be faithful until death. The church of Smyrna was a persecuted church and they would soon face martyrdom and death. How did the Lord know those things? Because this is His church. And you can go right down the line. For instance, verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write. And what, was, what, what details does he know about them? I have a few things against you. Because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. And then it goes on. The Nicolaitans. This was the church of compromise. In other words, Christ knows the churches intimately. He knows their name. He knows their issues. He knows what they're going through. He knows our church. He knows our church. You see, every church is unique. Every church has a name has a history, has a culture, has experiences, has unique struggles. And he knows the churches by name. He knows First Fundamental Bible Church of La Puente. Now that should bring us comfort. Comfort. Not only does he know churches by name, he knows you by name. He knows what you're going through. He knows the fears you face. He knows what keeps you awake at night. He knows your future. He knows your past. He knows what you're going through now. He knows your name. And that is comforting. That is comforting. Now, the third thing we'd like to look at out of Revelation is that Christ... He walks in the midst of the church. Look at verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands. What are those? Well, look at verse 20 at the end of the verse. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the seven golden lampstands represent and are the seven churches. And in the middle of the lampstands, in the middle of the churches, in the midst of the churches, I saw one like a son of man. And then it goes on to describe him. Christ is in the midst. He's in the middle. He's in the thick of things of the churches. Christ walks in the midst of his church. He's not somewhere disengaged and far, far away. He's in the very midst, the middle of the lampstands of the church. He's in the midst of the church, first of all, to comfort the church. Look at verse, look at verse 13. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. He has a long robe and a golden sash across his robe. What is that symbolic of? The Jewish high priest. Look at Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus 8, verse 6, describes the garment of the high priest. And look, look at the <clears throat> parallels between what you saw in Revelation. Leviticus 
8, verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron and his sons come near and washed them with water. He put the tunic on him and girded him with the sash and clothed him with the robe. <clears throat> and then when you look at chapter 16 of Leviticus, you see the same thing. Verse 4. 16 verse 4. He shall put on the holy tunic and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body. He shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. And then it goes on. So when you look at the high priest garments, it reminds you of what Revelation says. Christ is in the midst of the church clothed in a robe and girded with a golden sash. That is the garment of the high priest. So Christ is in the midst of the church as the church's high priest. And that is one of the major themes of the book of Hebrews. Look at Hebrews 2. Let's investigate this high priest idea. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 Hebrews 2 17 therefore he Christ had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Christ is our merciful and faithful high priest. What does a priest do? A priest teaches, represents, me uh, mediates, and sacrifices. Christ is our merciful and faithful high priest. He can represent us before a holy God because He became one of us, except for sin. He was made like His brethren in all things. He became a human. He was born of a virgin. He lived as a man. He died as a man. He is merciful and faithful, and He is our high priest, walking in the midst of His church, providing Comfort. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. He passed through the heavens. The atmospheric heaven the stellar heaven, into the third heaven, the abode of God. He successfully made the trip through the heavens. He passed through the heavens, and now we follow Him. He is our champion. He is our trailblazer. He is our way maker. He passed through the heavens and sits at the right hand of God, and because of that, we take comfort. So, when you put all those ideas together, you go back to Revelation, and we see that in the middle of the lampstands, the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to His feet, girded across His chest with a golden sash, as our high priest, our sympathetic, merciful high priest, Jesus, our mediator, our representative, our sacrifice, our teacher, walks in the midst of the church. Comfort. That brings us comfort. Now, another idea of him walking in the midst of the church in verse 14. Judgment. 
judgment. Verse 14, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Judgment. Judgment. Not primarily judgment on the world, although that's going to take place. He judges his church. He's very concerned with his church. He walks in the midst of the church. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Especially if the church is compromising. Look at chapter 2 of Revelation, verse 14. 214. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. Balaam, this false prophet, said, in order to cause Israel to stumble and to worship our gods, seduce them. Seduce them with women. And that's what happened. The men of Israel viewed the, the women of the Canaanites and were seduced by them not only physically seduced, but spiritually seduced. And things haven't changed a whole lot since this time. And also, uh, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. Commit acts of immorality with the women and then Sacrifice to the idols that the women worshipped. So also you have some in the same way who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. We don't know a whole lot about them, but we see them in verse 4 of chapter 2. But I have this against you, that you have le you've left your first love, and... Uh, it talks about the Nicolaitans there. The Nicolaitans, early church fathers believed that the Nicolaitans practiced self-indulgence and replaced liberty with license, very similar to those of Balaam. This was happening in, with, with the people of God. So judgment on the church when they compromise, when they allow false doctrine, when they allow immorality in the church. He wants the church to be pure because it's his bride and his eyes are a flame of fire as he goes through the church and sees the church not being what it should be. And he judges. He judges. He disciplines his church. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Discipline. He disciplines individual people in the church. Hebrews 12 verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. If you are a sinning Christian, the Lord will discipline you because you are his son, his daughter. Let's continue reading. Verse 6, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges. That's pretty harsh. He scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And then it goes on. The Lord will discipline his people. He'll discipline his church because 
He is in the midst of the church as its high priest and with the eyes flaming with fire to judge sin in the church. Now go back to Revelation 2. Revelation actually chapter, chapter 1, verse 15. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. So he's in the midst of the church. He is like a high priest. He is like a judge. And here, his voice is like the sound of many waters. Think about that figure of speech, that metaphor. His voice was like the sound of many waters. If you've ever been, a, if you've ever been around a great river cascading down a mountain, it's deafening. You cannot hear. It's thunderous. It speaks of his authority. He is authority. He is comfort. He is judge. He is authority. His voice is like the sound of many waters. Authority. He's in charge of his church. He walks in the midst of the church. He's in the middle. He's in the thick of things. To comfort, to maintain purity, and to lead with authority. That's the Lord. He walks in the midst of his church. Now, as we continue on in Revelation, he provides leaders for his church. Look at chapter 1, verse 16. This is kind of a disputed, uh, not, not a disputed, but there's two, view, two uh, trains of thought here on 1, verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. In his right hand, seven stars. What are the seven stars? Look at verse 20. As to the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angels of the seven churches. Angel angeloi means messenger. So is this saying that every church has a guardian angel? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think angel is talking about the messenger. Messenger. An instrument through which God manages and runs his church. I think it's talking about elders, pastors of the churches, messengers. They're in the right hand of the Lord. He uses them, he delegates management of his church. They're in his right hand to manage his church. Now, say, well, I, I think they're angels. Well, that would mean then, according to Dr. Thomas, who wrote a, a very authoritative commentary on Revelation, a New Testament scholar, he does not believe that angels are the supernatural beings, but rather messengers. Because if they were supernatural beings, then God tells John to write a book. Look at verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a loud voice saying, write in a book what you see. So, 
supernatural God writes, uh, delegates to a mortal man, John, a book, and then John is supposed to address that book to angels, supernatural beings, who in turn run the church. Because look at verse chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, verse 12, to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, and he goes on. So logically, you have God dictating to John, the apostle, a human, a book that John is supposed to then give to angels so that they in turn could run the church. Does it make sense? That is why Dr. Thomas and most and, and other biblical scholars believe that angel, angela, angeloi, speaks of messengers. Messengers. That the seven stars are the messengers the elders, if you will, of the seven churches. So John receives revelation from God and he writes it and he sends it to the, to the messengers of the seven churches, to the elders, to the pastor of these different churches. That makes a lot more sense. So, if that is the proper interpretation of the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, then they, these messengers are instruments, extensions of Christ to manage, to provide leadership and teaching to his church. That is why the qualifications for elders are so high. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Very high qualifications for elders. Because they represent Christ and they're used by Him to provide leadership to the church. It is a trustworthy, uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, that's an elder, a pastor, overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. And then here are the qualifications. An overseer then must be above reproach. That's a hard one. No one can say anything bad about you. In the church, where you live, at your job, at your school, people cannot say bad things about you. You're above reproach. The husband of one wife. You're not a womanizer. You're a one-woman man. Temperate. Temperate. You're not a drunkard. You're, you're, you're even, even tempered. Sober thinking. Prudent. You have a degree of wisdom. Respectable. Hospitable. Able to teach. You've got to be able to teach. Not addicted to wine. You're not a wino or a drunk. Or pugnacious, not a brawler, not ready to fight, but gentle, peaceful, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God and not a new convert? 
so that he will not become conceited and fall into the temptation incurred by the devil. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church. So those are the qualifications for an elder. Very high. Very high. Because an elder is an extension of Christ for his church. Now because of that, 1 Timothy 5, 17 talks about how elders are to be treated. 1 Timothy 5, 17. Because they represent Christ and have this high responsibility and are targets of satanic attack, they are to be treated in the following ways. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. So you honor them. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. You provide for them. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. You protect them. So you honor and pray for them. You provide for them and you protect them. That is how you treat elders. Elders have qualifications. They have to be met. And they are to be treated in those ways. So, back in Revelation. Back in Revelation. He provides leaders for his church. He provides leaders for his church. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Now here's the fourth point we like to look at. He protects his church. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Why the sword? Why the sword? He protects his church. He protects his church. Look at Revelation 2, verse 16. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Who's he going to make war against? These guys that we looked at earlier, those that were causing the people of Israel to stumble, those that were spreading false teaching within the people of God, he says, I'm going to make war against them with the sword of my mouth. The same sword that we read about right here in chapter 1, the sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It's a fearful metaphor and it symbolizes that Christ will make war with those who hurt his church. For somebody to try to cause division in God's church, make problems for the church, cause the church to struggle and fall, you are setting yourself up as an enemy of Christ who will, it says, make war with them. You should be fearful of causing the church of Jesus Christ to stumble. He protects his church. Look at Acts chapter 20. The church is always under attack from within and from without. 
Acts 20, verse 29. The church is always under attack. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. Verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So, savage wolves will come from outside, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, from among yourselves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So you've got the savage wolves from the outside coming in, and you've got, and you've got the troublemakers from within, the glory seekers. <clears throat> from within. From your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things. Look at the book of Jude, one chapter long, right before Revelation. Jude, look at the fourth verse. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, like a virus, right? A virus. You know, they talk about one of the most scary viruses out there is Ebola. Ebola lies semi dead for years until a suitable host appears. Then it comes to life and it enters the host. And it hijacks the cells. And it starts to replicate itself and eventually devours the host. Now, smart viruses don't kill the host. Because if they kill the host, they eventually die themselves. So a smart virus will just make the host very sick but won't totally kill them because in killing them they die themselves so say pastor where are you getting these I read a book recently what was it called hot zone hot zone Ebola for those that study infectious disease the safest kind is the disease, the virus that comes in quickly and kills the host because then it dies out. The smart viruses don't kill the host, they just infect the host, get them really sick so that the host goes to a hospital and then in the hospital affects the nurses and other patients and then you have a full-blown episode. But, getting back to our point, Jude, here we go, Jude, verse 4, certain persons have crept in unnoticed, like viruses, those who were beforehand marked out for condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Those that creep into the church and say, we're saved by grace, we're saved by grace, so we can live any way we want to live. They turn the grace of God into license, enabling them to live any way they want to live. Look at verse 19. These are the ones who cause divisions. Oh, well, we've got to watch those. Worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus to eternal life. 
He protects his church with a sharp two-edged sword. Then he comforts his church. Back in Revelation 1.17, he comforts his church. 1.17, when I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, All the beautiful words for those that are approaching death, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For those that are approaching death, do not be afraid. And look at this counsel. I am the first and the last. In other words, I am the eternal one. I am the eternal one. I'm the first and the last. I have no beginning. I have no end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. All of life lived out within my purview. I am eternal. I was here before you were born. I was, I'll be here after. I am the eternal one. I am the resurrected one, verse 18, and the living one. And I was dead. I was dead. I died. I literally died. John fell at his feet like a dead man. Jesus said, don't be afraid. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I was dead and I resurrected from the dead. So will you. So will you. You will face death unless you're raptured first. You will face death. But you will not stay dead because death will have no victory. You will rise from the dead. Why? Verse 18, I am the powerful one. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Synonyms, death and Hades. I have the key to death. You will not die until I open that door. I have the key of death. You will not die until I ordain it. And I will open the door. You will go through the door of death. And look at another book John wrote. John wrote the book of Revelation. He also wrote the Gospel of John. Look at this book of John, chapter 11. Don't be afraid. People are living in total fear today, afraid that the corona is going to get them. What you should really be afraid of is the flu. While you're finding John, let me tell you this. Since October, the flu season starts in October. October till now. October. November, December, January, February, six months flu season. October till now, you know how many people have died in the United States because of flu? 46,000. How many people have died because of Corona? 2,227. If you want to get fearful, I get more fearful about the 46,000 that died because of flu. Not to, not to minimize corona, but a lot more people have died because of the flu in the same period of time than that have died because of the coronavirus. Look at John 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus said, I have the keys of death. When it's time for you to die, I will open that door. You will go through death, but you won't really die. You'll die physically, but it says right here, you will never die. You're going to die physically. Your body will stay in the grave for a few years until I call it forth. But as soon as you close your eyes here, you open them there. He comforts his church. He comforts his church. And then finally, he entrusts his church. Revelation 1.19 119. Therefore, write. Therefore, as a result of the vision I've just showed you, John, I want you to write it down. I want you to write the things which you've seen. That is the vision he just saw. And I want you to write the things which are. That's going to be chapters two through three, the seven churches. And I want you to write the things will take place after these things. That's chapters four through 22. I want you to write. I'm entrusting you with a book of the things that you've just seen, the things that are now, and the things that will be in the future. I'm entrusting you to write down faithfully what you've seen in a book. I want you to record it. I want you to disseminate it to the seven churches, and from there to the churches through the ages. I'm entrusting you to write this down and to get the message out. He entrusts his church. Now, he's not giving us further revelation as a church. He's not giving us any new books. The canon has been closed. He's not giving us any new revelation now, but he's given us a beautiful book called the Bible that he wants it to go out. The message of the Bible is Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all Jesus Christ. It's his story. He entrusts his story to his church to get it out. And that is what we are called to do. So we see a thorough presentation of Christ and his church. We've seen that he expects his church to honor the Lord's day. We've seen that he knows the church by name. And he walks in the midst of the church. Comfort, judgment, and authority. And he provides leaders for his church, the seven stars. He protects his church with the sword coming out of his mouth. He comforts his church. And he entrusts his church. The church of Jesus Christ belongs to Christ. We are part of that church. We belong to Christ. May that comfort you and motivate you during this time. Brother Raul, can you come forward and close us in a word of prayer? Before we close, there's a couple of uh, announcements I'd like to uh, to give to uh, to our members. Uh, first of all, uh, members, I'd like to uh, let you know that this week is the last week of uh, of our quarter, and with that in mind, uh, I'd like to let you know that tithes can be mailed in to First Fundamental Bible Church. To check in an envelope and uh, mail it to our address at 13925 Nelson Avenue, La Puente, California, 91746. Or you can go online to our website at ffbc.org 
And uh, there on, on the left hand corner is a PayPal link that you can use. Or we have a third option now. It's called Tidely. T-I-T-H-E-L-Y. If you go there, just uh, download the app. It's real easy to use. And uh, just uh, look for our church. It's already registered there. And uh, your tithes can be paid really, really easy. So that is for our members. Also, updates. We are sending out updates on a weekly basis. If you uh, are not receiving them and would like to, just email me. That's R-A-U-L-Y-D, the number one, at yahoo.com. That is my email address, and I'll put you on the mailing list. Again, that's R-A-U-L-Y-D, the number one, at yahoo.com, so that I can put you on the mailing list and get you our updates. Also, I would like to let you know that this past Wednesday, Pastor started a Wednesday night Bible study that is streamed again to Facebook on John 3.16. And if uh, you didn't hear the first message, it is archived there and you can go back and listen to it. It was a great message. With that, if you would please bow with me as we ask the Lord to, to close our our uh, session together, um, please bow with me as we ask the Lord to dismiss us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message that you brought to us through Pastor. Oh, Lord, what, what a great feeling to know that you are our protector. You protect your church. You guard your church. Father, you do everything for your church. And Father, we thank you that you are our guardian. Oh Lord, we thank you for the men that make it possible for this broadcast to go out. We thank you for all involved and for those who tune in, Lord. We pray, Lord, that they contact others and tell them how to download Facebook, how to use Facebook uh, and John 3.16 for them to also get fed with your word. Father, that we not become complacent, that we not, Lord, get drawn into fears and, 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 and dread that the news of the coronavirus is, is given on a well, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis in a lot of the news uh, areas. But it said that we use our time, Lord, to delve into your word, to be diligent, Lord, to know and trust in you. And Father, we ask you to dismiss us now. Again, we thank you for all who heard this message. And we ask you to bless Pastor as he prepares for Wednesday night Bible study. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.